Rest in peace to the phrase, always leave them wanting more, an essay by Matt Ruby. That's me. Rest in peace to the phrase, always leave them wanting more. Now, it's hold on to them for as long as you can. And man, it sucks. Here's the great thing about watching the World Cup. The matches only take 90 minutes. I mean, okay, there's a little extra time to make up for all that flopping, plus, you know, a quick halftime, but otherwise, the clock's ticking. It's so unlike American sports. There are no commercial breaks, timeouts, or halftime concerts turning the whole thing into a three-plus-hour slog. And man, it's damn refreshing to watch something that leaves some content on the bone. Meanwhile, I just saw an ad for the new Shaq doc on HBO, and I rolled hard when it told me to get ready for episodes. Episodes? Plural? Of Shaq? Look, dude was a great player, no doubt, but I don't need a deep dive on Kazam or insight into how he managed to rap. From high school to college, you give me enough knowledge. Uh, I get it. I blame that OJ doc, which was genuinely great and deserved its lengthy runtime. That set the stage for the Jordan doc, which aired during the height of lockdown, so we ate up all 10 parts of it, no problem. But come on, do we really need a whole episode on Rodman's clown show? And after that, it was open season for Doc Inflation. I mean, that Jeter one? Seven episodes? It should have been half as long, tops. And sorry, Shaq, but 90 minutes is more than enough to tell your tall tale. It's not just sports docs either. Every media outlet is all about creating content that maximizes mindshare now. Curious about that Nixium cult or those wild, wild country kooks? Well, you better get ready to be in the cult of watching 34 hours of people wearing those weird little rectangle glasses and talking about their journey or whatever. Everything's stretched to its breaking point now, droning on and on until we're forced to say uncle. I know, we live in the attention economy and the marching orders for all media entities now is to frack our brain stems for as long as possible. But in the process, we've lost sight of the notion of the sweet spot. You know, not too little and not too much, just an appropriate amount. Take the latest Beatles reissue, Revolver, Super Deluxe. Look, I'm a huge Beatles fan, but that doesn't mean I'm some scavenger desperate for whatever crumbs were left on the Abbey Road studio floor. I don't need to hear every single unearthed demo, false start, mono mix, and Ringo fart. Yet here we are with five takes of Yellow Submarine, even though they already decided long ago on the best version to release. And also, I don't even need one take of Yellow Submarine. That was the good thing about shelf space. People had to decide what was worth including. Actual inventory required making trade-offs. But now that everything's digital, there are no boundaries. There's no bartender cutting us off, so we all just keep getting digitally hammered. We infinite scroll and b-side ourselves into media gluttony, oversaturating our minds with mediocrity. This kitchen sink mentality is spreading beyond the digital realm, too. More and more, we're seeing a good-on-the-poster-sucks-in-real-life approach to live events. Do whatever it takes to sell tickets. That's the mission. The actual quality of the experience on the back end, be damned. Recently, there was a food fest in New York City called EatsCon. It was uh, at Forest Hill Stadium, and, you know, they had hundreds of food vendors there. And then at the end of the poster, after listing them all, it says, and so much more. How much more do you need? I mean, I get a gathering with a few food trucks, but hundreds of food vendors? Look, I only have one stomach. I'm going to eat lunch once and then be done. And then what happens? No one needs this much optionality. They should have called it the your eyes are bigger than your stomach fest. Likewise, Comedy Central did this big festival of comedians called Cluster Fest a while back that listed dozens upon dozens of different comedians all performing in one weekend. And I get it. That sounds extra fun. But in truth, it's actually extra lame. No one wants to sit through hours upon hours of back to back comedians. Comedy requires paying close attention, and that's only doable for so long. There's a reason comedy shows never last longer than two hours. It's bad for the performers and bad for the crowd. But hey, it's good for the flyers, so what the hell? And this throw-it-all-against-the-wall approach, obviously it goes for Music Fest now, too. I mean, have you ever looked at a Coachella poster? It's like a Spotify algorithm come to life. But who the hell wants to see all of those acts? More ain't always more. I'll take one great band I want to see in a venue that's made for listening to music over an avalanche of ordinariness in a field of porta-potties any day. I mean, how many Woodstock docs do we need to see before we realize these gatherings aren't actually for music lovers? They're for mooks who wind up covered in mud, enduring bad trips, and paying $12 for a bottle of water. But you know, you gotta do it for the gram or whatever. 
even high-end scenesters fall for it too. A bunch of them go to Art Basel in Miami every year attempting, in theory, to see art from 282 galleries and then hundreds more at the satellite shows. I've been before, and one thing I learned from going is how little I enjoy wandering a convention center filled with millions of pieces of art for over five hours. It's overwhelming and the antithesis to actually appreciating art. I want to visit a good museum for 90 minutes and then leave while my sanity is still intact. In fact, I've come to think the right answer to almost everything is 90 minutes. Is your movie The Godfather? If not, keep it at 90 minutes. I don't want to spend all day climbing a mountain. I want a nice hike in the woods for... You guessed it, 90 minutes. And give me one and a half hour sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, documentaries, and, well, everything else. Enough is enough. 90 minutes, that's the sweet spot. that essay originally appeared in my Rubes letter, my weekly newsletter that you can sign up for at mattrubycomedy.com slash subscribe. And now I'd like to bring in the producer of this podcast, Jeremiah McVeigh, to discuss what I wrote. So Matt, I wanted to ask you in response to your essay there, what's a, what's a three hour movie you really like? Hmm. Other than The Godfather. I guess uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, There Will Be Blood, wasn't that like three hours or close to it? Two and a half? I think, it was, I think it was like two and a half to three hours, something like that. Yeah. So yeah. I think that counts. It's uh, longer than 90 minutes, which is what you've uh, pinpointed as the sweet spot for that sort of thing. Sure. Um, I mean, all of these things, I think, as we get into your, uh, your podcast more, are going to have exceptions that prove the rule, right? Sure. Yeah, I like I like to kind of take a, a, a stark uh, take and draw a line on something with the assumption that the audience is intelligent enough to know that there's always, you know, exceptions to to things like this and, uh, you know, going to be times where I'm not uh, religious about it. But just in general, I, I see the trend in society towards trying to, like, extend and stretch everything as long as possible until we finally give up. And that makes me miss editing because I just feel like uh, when I was learning how to create art, you know, that was something that was so valuable to me to kill your darlings, to chop out everything that doesn't belong. Like, you know, I, like, this idea that like someone would repackage a Hemingway novel and put in like the 30 bonus pages that <laughs> Hemingway took out of there would be yeah. like a nightmare to me because that's the whole reason it's good is because he chopped out every word that doesn't matter and same thing with like the Beatles is like a great example to me because like those albums are like incredible in part because they are 35 minutes and in and out and this idea that we need to hear every single like extra you know bit that got left on the cutting room floor is is just annoying to me I mean I, like uh I feel like uh, imagine if if you got a, a nude from a girlfriend and then you're like, oh, this is amazing. And then she just starts sending you all the the bad shots of, you know, the, where the lighting's wrong and she's got a double chin <laughs> and here are her warts. And here's the group chat where she was talking with her friends about it and just be like, yeah, I wish you had just sent the one pick and been done with it. That, that would have been a better scenario for me. Right. So I think you would appreciate this then. And I, I'm probably going to talk about movies a lot because that's kind of like my background, you know, but sure. Um, I don't know if you remember when Blood Simple, the Coen Brothers movie, was re-released in uh, it was either the very late 90s or the very early 2000s. It was when I was in college. And it was a director's cut of, of their first movie, Blood Simple, like I said. And it was actually shorter than the original theatrical I release. Love it. I love the it. rare the rare instance, I think, where a director's cut shortened the film. They were just like, I I I took that as there were more mature filmmakers, looked at the movie, were embarrassed by something, took it out. Um, so that's something that goes in line with what you're talking about. But trying to find another exception to prove the rule. Has there ever been a director's cut of a movie or um, an album with with outtakes or or bonus material or anything that you have actually thought imp improved the work or brought insight to the work that you really appreciated reframed no, I, it somehow no i think that's a good a good point because i do think if you're like an expert if you're a songwriter it can be really interesting to hear a john lennon demo if if you're you know uh an obsessive like velvet underground fan it can be cool to go back and hear 
these versions, you know, at different tempos. And uh, I think that's even, you know, I remember the Beatles anthology, you know, the first go round when they were releasing a bunch of extra stuff and being fascinated. I was in a band at the time and writing songs and being fascinated by how they would try every song at like six different tempos. Because in my head, you just know the one right tempo of the song and you just assume it, it came pouring out of them in that format. But in actuality, you hear them, you know, trying, you know, oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, da, really slow or really sped up and like realizing like, oh, yeah, even the Beatles had to like kind of experiment and, and take a swing in all different kinds of ways to figure out um, what's what's the right angle to go for. And so I do think if you're an obsessive, if you're like a collector, if you're uh, an artist pursuing uh, that particular craft, there can be valuable things in there. I think where I bristle is that's not how these things are presented. They're presented for mass consumption. They're presented, you know, for a mainstream audience. And it, in my mind, it just winds up diluting the entire canon. I'm sticking with the music stuff of, you know, like just kind of going in and listening to this album the way it was intended to be listened to. And instead shows you, you know, all this, uh, uh, I don't know, just extra crap that, you know, like people left out for a reason. Um, and, and to me, it's like an unpleasant listening experience. I love to put on an album and kind of lose myself in it. And to me, this is the opposite. This is like a homework assignment from a, a teacher trying to, to educate you about this act. Um, so I, I think, um, you know what, there was a Bob Marley box set that came out years ago and Crosby, Stills and Nash had a box set. And I remember, they gave me, those were two artists that I was like fine about, but I wouldn't have called myself like a super fan. And I remember going through to those and like really gaining a new appreciation. Um, but again, that was maybe, you know, like a couple like acoustic demos thrown in the mix or something, but overwhelmingly just the actual output that the artist approved of and wanted to put out in the world. So I guess maybe that's what I would advocate for is a formula that's more like that as opposed to this just pile on of detritus that is you know inferior to what the original product was right well i think that's a good place to leave it how about you sure and now for some quickies disco nap is a great way to make depression sound sexy Believing in recycling is like believing in the tooth fairy. I'm sure my crap goes somewhere, I just don't believe it's really going where they tell me it's going. As a Judeo, I'd like to withdraw us from the phrase Judeo-Christian because we did not agree to this partnership in perpetuity and let's just say things have gotten a bit unkempt on your side of the lawn. Comedy is an exercise in fetishizing trauma. You can subscribe to or follow this show just about anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you have a moment, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or anywhere else that allows you to do that. And when I say that, I mean, like, leave it a good review. I feel like that's obvious, but if, you, if you're just going to leave it a bad review, you, you don't have to. Anyway, it helps others find the show, which I really appreciate. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at mattruby at hey.com. That's mattruby at H-E-Y dot com. And if you like this podcast, you should subscribe to the Rubes Letter, where what you just heard first appeared. You can find that at mattrubycomedy.com slash subscribe. And while you're at mattrubycomedy.com, you can also find links to my Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok, where I post clips of my stand-up and other stuff too. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media. 